Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Wolf SSL live webinar on Wolf Sentry, our Wolf SSL IDPS, um, with Wolf SSL engineer Daniel Posner. Posner. Uh, Posner, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, my name is Kajal Subkota, and I will be moderating this webinar. All attendees will be in listen only mode. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A box or raise your hand to be unmuted if you would like to ask the question live as we do host a Q&A session following this presentation. The webinar will also be recorded and made available via our YouTube channel shortly after the presentation. We also supply uh, slide sets or slide decks to anyone who requests it. So please let us know following the presentation if you would like that as well. Um, I invite everyone to follow us on Twitter at Wolf SSL, as well as all of our other socials. And please feel free to email us at fax at wolfssl.com if you have any additional questions. And now I'd like to give a brief company overview before we move to the technical presentation. Wolf SSL was founded in 2004 by Todd Auska and Larry Stefanik when they realized there wasn't an open source dual licensed embedded SSL library available. Open SSL existed at the time, but there was a demand for an alternative that was uh, easily portable, smaller, faster, available under a clear commercial license, was equipped with a clean and modern API, and offered commercial style developer support. Wolf SSL was born into this market need with an open SSL compatibility layer. Today, Wolf SSL secures over 2 billion connections. We have more than 1,000 OEM customers and dozens of resellers. Wolf SSL is made up of almost 50 dedicated employees in 2021, most of which are engineers. This process is, of course, supported by a strong partner network that we're very proud of, which includes SD Micro, Curl, and ISRG, for example. Since the beginning, our engineering team has developed several embedded security products, including WolfCrypt with DO178 support. FIPS certification and a FIPS ready offering, MQTT up to the version 5 specification, SSH v2, TPM 2.0, and a secure bootloader known as Wolfboot, as well as Java wrappers and JSSC support and commercial support for curl. All of these offerings are accompanied by a thorough maintenance and support plans up to the 24 7 level. We also offer full service consulting. And now I'm going to hand it over to Daniel for the presentation. So what we're looking at here on this slide is our, our current product uh, suite. And uh, the thing that's very exciting about Wolf Sentry is that Wolf Sentry will be tying together many of these technologies through a, a logic hub. And uh, that's our IDPS. That's Wolf Sentry. And you're going to be hearing a lot more about it over the next hour. This, this is just a, um, this is a, a, a boilerplate slide that, um, that we use to show just how thorough our testing is. We have a, um, a, a cluster of test servers that run every line of code through a huge battery of tests. Nothing gets, reaches our customers until it's already been tested thoroughly using customer example configurations that we run in-house. So let's look at IDSs and IDPSs. Um, an IDS, uh, everybody's familiar at this point with an IDS. IDS is offerings like FireEyes and Senrios and, and the various network instrumentation solutions that allow you to monitor network traffic from within the network um, and watch for threat indicators. They tend to be heavyweight offerings. They tend to involve large databases um, with uh, uh, signatures of, uh, of threat activity and threat payloads, and they're infrastructure heavy, and almost all of them involve a large cloud aspect. So they require not just connectivity, but a, a big infrastructure. Um, and that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be uh, making a comparison between our lightweight offering and the, the traditional heavyweight offerings. An IDPS is simply an IDS that actively prevents 
abusive activity from impacting your quality of service. Wolf Sentry is an IDPS. So here, this is just calling out all of the, the attributes that I just described. So typical IDSs, um, they are elaborate. They involve large scale online databases, curated rule sets. Often they involve machine learning, which is inherently um, heavy and, um, and has a large impact on the computational and resource footprint of the solution. And the IDS is typically also involved deployment of custom software and custom, often custom hardware um, to the infrastructure. So it's not a fire and forget solution and it often involves subscription uh, services in order to keep your role sets current and such. As I said, an IDPS is just an IDS in principle, it's just an IDS that adds active orchestration of preventative measures in order to protect your infrastructure to maintain your quality of service. So you can actually take an IDS and many companies do this. You can take a heavyweight IDS and add orchestration to it to dynamically add uh, rules into firewall infrastructure uh, to dynamically uh, act inside endpoints, inside hosts in order to protect uh, quality of service. And you can also uh, protect uh, directories, LDAP and, and DNS and such um, to uh, route around uh, troubled parts of your network that have been impacted by intrusive activity. So Wolf Sentry is an IDPS, but it's none of these things. Wolf IDPS gets you this type of preventative orchestration, but without this type of carry cost. So that's, that's an important differentiator. So in a nutshell, uh, Wolf Sentry is a universal dynamic embeddable IDPS. It's oriented both toward bare metal and toward Linux use cases where, where you have a, a heavyweight target. Um, and we're supporting multiple uh, architectures from the start and both 32 and 64 bit. Um, it's written in pure C. Um, that obviously makes it much easier to port. Um, uh, and on the inside, uh, Wolf Sentry is actually a firewall. It has a firewall engine that does the traditional uh, checks on whether a particular pair of endpoints are allowed to continue with the session they're trying to establish. Uh, so a basic traffic control, but it has fully extensible logic. And I'm gonna go into more detail in the next slide about what it means to have fully extensible logic. We've uh, designed Wolf Sentry from the ground up to tailor it for the embedded use case, the resource constrained use case, the bare metal use case and the real time use case. And in particular, the memory footprint, the volatile state footprint, and the time footprint of Wolf Sentry are all carefully controlled to maintain de deterministic dynamics, allowing it to be embedded inside uh, technology platforms that must perform within a, a deadline period of time and, and where the availability of the service is absolutely mission critical. So, the extensibility of Wolf Sentry is one of the ways that we keep the footprint of Wolf Sentry under control. It's a dynamically configurable logic hub, which means that the application developer can hang all sorts of intricate application specific logic um, off the internal logic hub of Wolf Sentry. So the complexity is compartmented inside the user's application and the user's libraries, rather than the, the IDPS having to learn about the application use case. And this is very, very important for maintaining, for both making the technology very cheap to sustain and also keeping the footprint uh, very constrained. And the reason it's important is that the developer can leverage all of the complexity and the wisdom the logic embedded in the user's application specific libraries in order to categorize traffic into correct and abusive traffic without having to add any new logic inside the IDPS. And this is, it's sort of the opposite of the way a traditional IDS or IDPS works because we're not attempting to maintain any databases of uh, threat signatures um, or, and orchestration logic is also user supplied. So we're not attempting to create a parallel set of scripts um, or uh, other uh, mechanisms 
that can respond to threat patterns. Instead, the user already has mechanisms for responding to threat patterns and already has knowledge of what looks like a threat, what looks like abuse, and simply plugs that logic, that existing logic, into Wolf Sentry so that Wolf Sentry can serve as a logic backbone to keep track of the events and maintain state over time for penalty boxing for a user defined period of time. So the like any firewall solution, and Wolf Sentry is, you know, at its heart, it is a firewall style solution. Um, you define rules. Um, and there's two ways you can do that. You can do it in the traditional simple static firewall way. And I'm going to actually demonstrate that um, in real time uh, with, a, with a live demo in a, in a minute or two. Um, and everybody understands that. That's, that's a very simple proposition where you have a set of IP addresses and protocols and ports that you're expecting to see legitimate traffic from. And you green list the, 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 the traffic that you expect and all other traffic is ignored. But the more interesting use case with Wolf Sentry is the ability to dynamically respond to abusive threats and dynamically instantiate new rules that block only the abusive traffic while allowing all other traffic. And you know, as I said, the, the way Wolf Sentry supplies that capability is by leveraging the wisdom, the sunk cost, the, the engineering that's already gone into the application's libraries and the application itself. And the application just installs callbacks and performs call ends in order to keep track of state and then respond to state. So I'm going to get this live demo going here. This is actually just our, this is our unit test that we run on our TLS library. And it's just going to run through some, some regular like cryptographic checks and such. And then it runs through a whole long set of client server use cases. And those are just going to stream by. And if you look closely, you'll be able to see that I have some debugging printifs that are going to show the callback happening. And they're all green listed because what I've set up is a static rule that allows localhost to make uh, to, to access the server. But then partway through the unit tests, one of the unit tests is coming from an unexpected address. And you'll see that it's just stopped cold. And the unit test will actually stop, and you'll be able to see the error message. So while that runs in the background, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue with the slides because it's gonna take a little while to get there. But the, uh, the, the nice thing about Wolf Sentry is it has no meaningful impact on the throughput of this test that's running here. It runs it effectively exactly the same speed as if there were no network filtration going on. But you'll see that when the unexpected traffic comes in, it just gets stopped cold. And this is done entirely at the library level. It's just plugged in. It's just an integration of Wolf Sentry into the into our TLS library, and it's all automatic. There's no there's no need to to do any special uh, development in order to to gain this capability. It's just the static case. But a few weeks down the road, we'll be also uh, delivering the dynamic case, and then this type of capability. Uh, will be effectively zero configuration. So because it's a firewall, the main way that rule decisions are made is simply by looking at network addresses, protocols, ports, the usual sorts of attributes. You can also, there it is, session stop by network filter. So this happened because the, the request came in from this unexpected address, 00320, instead of the usual 127.001. And just stops it cold with a session stop by network filter using the, um, the install callback. So very simple, very easy. So the rule decisions are, you know, at, at the, the in the top line, they're keyed on network addresses and product, the, the usual sorts of stuff that firewalls look at. But Applications can have application-specific data associated with each connection, and the callbacks installed by the application can look at that private data. So if there's additional information that the application wants to track in order to later be, be in a better position to classify traffic as a, a friendly or hostile, it can, it can set up the configuration to allow that data to be tracked for each connection in the system. So the, uh, our roadmap calls for, as you've already seen, we're, we're already well along in the process of integrating it into our TLS library here. 
Um, we'll also be integrating it into the uh, MQTT library, the SSH library, and, and other technologies in the Wolf SSL product suite. Um, and you know, as I said, the, probably one of the most exciting um, aspects of Wolf Sentry is the possibility of not just zero configuration, but zero development IDPS, where the the techno the the code to do what the application needs to do to protect itself has already been developed as part of the application, and uh, just a few more lines of code to to write callbacks, install them, and then perform call ends will give an application IDPS capability with almost no development and basically no configuration at all. And this, this test here, this was accomplished using a very simple configuration. I simply added in enable Wolf Sentry into the TLS library build, and that switched on the callbacks and the call-ins and made everything work. And that's the way it will work for all of our technologies. You'll simply add enable Wolf Sentry. If you're building from source, you'll enable Wolf Sentry. Um, and if you're uh, building outside the config and a, an embedded environment, you will simply define a, pre, a preprocessor um, gate and it will switch on the IDPS integration and you'll be good to go. So there's two ways that you can configure Wolf Sentry. You can dynamically configure it at runtime through an API that allows rules to be added and removed dynamically from the application. Um, and you can also load configuration files either at start time or dynamically at any time during runtime. Um, the demo that you see here was done using the API. Um, the, uh, the configuration file capability will come later uh, before, before the uh, initial full release. Um, and as I said, we're going to be fully implementing, uh, integrating into MQTT, and we will also be providing industry standard logging solutions. So that if you want this event here, where the network filter was triggered to produce a syslog event or an email alert or an MQTT event, then that will that we will have off the commercial off the shelf solutions that give you that capability also. And we will eventually be supplying dynamic queryability and configurability through a RESTful API and potentially also through an embedded web server that is directly viewable from a web browser. So let's talk about use cases. Now, I, I, I've implied many of them and, and the demo that I did here showed a sort of a simulation of a use case where you have rapid traffic and then some unexpected traffic comes in that's considered a threat indicator and it's immediately blocked. This was just the static uh, Wolf Sentry case. The dynamic Wolf Sentry case is the more interesting case. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in the context of typical threat patterns. So threat patterns fall into, you know, typically three, three categories. There's the obvious one of brute force password guessing and port scanning where the attacker is looking for shortcomings in the endpoint configuration that can be exploited, weak passwords or uh, daemon servers that are running on the endpoint that perhaps shouldn't be running and actually present a vulnerability. So, you know, looking for uh, exposed surface area. Um, and that's, that's the, an obvious use case for dynamic firewalls. The application knows when someone has attempted to get in using a bad password and the application can call in the fact that a particular, in, a, a particular peer has submitted a bad password, and then Wolf Sentry will, keep, will count that. And when it gets to a certain threshold count, a dynamic firewall rule will be inserted um, that will penalty box that uh, network address for whatever uh, time period the, uh, the, the technician thinks is appropriate, the, whatever policy makes sense. Typically, you do like, an hour or two hours or something like that. The, another class, and this is, this is a class of attack that's particular to uh, cryptographically protected network connections, which of course now means basically all network connections. The public key operations that are used in order to negotiate keys um, in, in many, particularly TLS type um, solutions for securing network connections, 
are quite expensive. And in, they're particularly expensive in embedded applications where you have, yeah, a small 16 or 32 bit microcontroller um, and you want it to perform, you know, an elliptic curve operation or even worse, a, like a, a 2K or 4K RSA operation that can take up potentially seconds of time um, on the, the embedded uh, processor. And during that time, that processor isn't available for other operations. So that is an ideal vector for deni denial of service attacks. And it needs to be defended. Any embedded device that has limited processor power and is connected to any untrusted network needs to have protection against abusive public key operations of uh, being uh, submitted to it. Um, so what the application can do, and the, our TLS library will do this um, automatically out of the, out of the box, um, is keep count of the number of negotiations that a network address has attempted. And when it gets to it without, without success, without completing the negotiation, um, and when it gets to a threshold count, penalty box the peer in order to protect quality of service um, from the public key operations that would otherwise um, continue to suck up resources. And the third category is a, a, a connection bomb, where this could be either from a single host, a, a single abusing host attempting to make many connections in parallel, or it could be a, a distributed denial of service attack. And these are the most challenging uh, to protect against. And these are particularly dangerous because they can actually bring in the first two um, and do so with, with maximum impact on quality of service. So being able to recognize and respond to distributed denial of service attacks um, is, that's the gold standard for whether you have stabilized your endpoint against attacks. Um, and that is the use case that I that that Wolf Sentry is particularly oriented to protect from. And as long as once the uh, once the abusive pattern has been detected, and the attacker has been penalty boxed, traffic from the attacker can no longer impact quality of service. Now there is a reverse use case which we think we will be able to meaningfully address which is inside your network, it's possible for a compromised or malfunctioning endpoint to effectively launch a denial of service against your own infrastructure. And th this is something that, you know, system administrators see this sort of thing happen. And it happens with email systems. Um, it happens with automatic update systems. Uh, sometimes what you'll have is infinite loops of uh, reattempted uh, connections um, that are uh, causing like the zombie processes to be uh, sitting around the system, these types of access patterns can actually be stopped at their source. You can use Wolf Sentry in order to instrument your endpoint so that your endpoint won't spam your own bus by configuring a policy that recognizes when you have something malfunctioning. Because as the operator of the application, you know what the correct pattern looks like. And this creates an opportunity to protect you from yourself in a zero or near zero configuration fashion. Well, it wouldn't be zero, that way isn't zero configuration, but it's a near zero and near zero carry cost. So I was talking about untrusted networks. Untrusted networks is actually, it, one of the things I do is I ask, um, you know, do you have untrusted networks? And it's a trick question because you can't trust any networks. All networks can bear traffic that is a threat um, and treating a network as trusted is the, is, is the first step on a, a primrose path to being compromised. So the key thing is to put your security as close to your endpoint as possible so that you trust your network as little as possible. That's why we use cryptography in the first place. And that's why you need wolf sentry in the first place. It's so that you can use your network. You can benefit from your network in order to move data around, but you don't trust your network. You're getting all the benefits without the downside. Cryptography gets you half of the way there. Wolf Sentry gets you the rest of the way there. Now, in this earlier slide, um, Kajal was talking over this slide. Um, and we give you an idea of the types of deployments that we typically see with our customers 
for our TLS library, our MQTT library, our other technologies. Um, it, it's heavy on embedded. It's certainly not exclusive to embedded, but it's heavy on embedded and critical infrastructure, mission critical applications. And the applications for Wolf Sentry are, of course, very similar. Um, and, and that basically means that if you're doing any of these sorts of applications, then you should be thinking about leveraging Wolf Sentry, particularly because it's so cheap to integrate and will be supplying turnkey automatic integration um, uh, that integrates with our current technology suite that can be leveraged by anyone who's already integrated our current technologies. So I wanna take a look at how we've developed Wolf Sentry on the inside. As I said, it's, it's a central logic hub. Um, it's plugin based. The, we are developing a suite of turnkey commercial off the shelf plugins that uh, create a lot of interesting capabilities right, right out of the box. And you, you can see how our, our cryptographic library, uh, our TLS library creates opportunities to do that at the outset with some very meaningful benefits um, right out of the box. And then application specific integrations can be easily achieved by installing plugins. The plugins get tied together by dynamic policies and those dynamic policies can be set at runtime. They can be set in the field they're set by end users and technicians. We don't set the policies. The libraries don't set the policies. The end user or technician sets the policies. And those policies can be set in human readable configuration files or file-like blobs that can be installed uh, using our API. Wolf Sentry is built around three logical entities. One of them is called a route. And a route is like a traditional firewall rule. It can be manually inserted or it can be automatically inserted as I've described. And a route has a local endpoint, uh, which is a network address, a protocol, et cetera, um, and a remote address associated with it and a directionality, whether it's incoming or outgoing. Actions are the, the heart of the plugin system. Um, each plugin is effectively an action with a handle. Um, a, a nameable handle chosen by the user um, that allows it to be referred to and invoked in a dynamically configurable fashion. And then events are just um, handles, their names, that have associated with the dynamically configurable sets of actions to be executed in a particular order with particular contingencies when and uh, 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 with, uh, with reference to the installed routes and actions. There's static and dynamic firewalls built into the system. And in order to make both the internal dynamics simple um, and understanding of the system dynamics easy, they're kept totally separate. So when a connection comes in, when uh, a decision needs to be made, first, the static um, table of routes um, is consulted. And only if the static table doesn't give a decisive answer whether to accept or reject the, the traffic, um, is the dynamic system invoked. So that keeps it very uh, simple to understand, to, to understand how the system will behave. So as I said, the, the, the policy that associates events, actions, and routes can be either dynamically updated through an API or can be loaded in a file, and the file can be loaded at startup time um, or at any time during runtime for a reconfiguration without bringing the system down. And as I've been discussing, the, the uh, Wolf Sentry uh, allows for generic data um, to be uh, passed in and used by the user supplied plugins. Um, and also, of course, the plugins have full access to the network connection attributes that are the, the traditional uh, key uh, data for firewall engines. So on the inside, uh, Wolf Sentry uh, uses O log in. So this is a, this is a bit of the computer science that goes into how Wolf Sentry maintains deter deterministic dynamics. But what we do in order to bound the time that it takes for Wolf Sentry to make a decision is first we use 
these highly efficient internal um, lookup tables that allow us to store many, many uh, addresses, but look them up very, very quickly. Um, and this, this speaks to the use case with distributed denial service attacks in particular. When, you're in, when your, your target platform has enough memory to support keeping track of many addresses, then you can really leverage this capability of looking up the known addresses very quickly because it then becomes extremely cheap, extremely computationally um, inexpensive to block the threat traffic while maintaining quality of service for the, the, uh, the legitimate traffic. Another thing that we've implemented in order to uh, maintain de deterministic dynamics is uh, shareable, a shareable, a custom shareable lock mechanism that allows for in a multi-processor or a multi-threaded um, environment, it allows for many lookups to be proceeding in parallel inside the high efficiency lookup table. So this results in uh, the, this is at the technological limit of how quickly um, traffic can be classified into uh, abusive or legitimate. The, uh, the internal architecture um, is highly generic. Um, yes, of course, it supports IPv4, IPv6, MAC addresses, the, the usual sorts of addressing schemes, but we're actually using generic bit vectors and, and generic prefixing. So any address scheme can be used. It could be USB port addresses, endpoints. It could be anything that can fit into this type of addressing scheme, which is basically any addressing scheme at all. The, uh, because it's oriented toward embedded environments, uh, the, the, the allocation routines, the time functions, the, the internal type that's used for timekeeping, um, can all be user set, user supplied. Um, and beca also because we're oriented toward the embedded use case, the, uh, the, the, the allocation system is oriented toward fixed memory pools. Um, and we will be supplying automatic route table compaction. And what that means is that if there's a, a threat network that is launching a parallel attack against your endpoint, from many IP addresses that all share uh, a, the, a, an, an address prefix, and you don't have any legitimate traffic that's coming from that address prefix, and your memory resources become stressed, the system can automatically compactify all of the route, uh, all, all of the rules, all the routes that have been inserted for those uh, abusive endpoints into a single entry in the table that blocks all traffic from that route. So this is our current um, anticipated uh, release schedule. A couple of weeks from now, we'll have an initial um, uh, preview release, um, which will have capabilities like you see here. Um, it'll be under GPL. Um, a couple of weeks later, we'll be uh, doing a preview release of the dynamic firewall. And then we'll be doing full releases in May and June, and you'll see uh, more uh, target environments um, coming out um, and more target silicon uh, coming out um, in the weeks and months to come. Um, and probably most exciting, you'll see all of the integrations into all of our other technologies um, coming out in the weeks and months to come. And this is uh, one of the first uh, pieces of uh, hardware that we'll be um, uh, supporting. This is, a, um, this is an embedded application that's using DOS and LWIP. Um, and uh, we'll, be, we'll, be, um, we, we'll, be, uh, we'll have that up and running in a matter of days, in fact. So the, the, the very first environment it's running in is, uh, is uh, Linux and Unix. And the embedded uh, use case is up and running before the initial preview release. Over to you, Kajal. Alrighty, well, we let people type their questions in. There are a few here. Um, will Wolf's entry be integrated into Wolf MQTT SN as well? Absolutely. Yeah, there's, okay. there's a, because the differentiating use case with Wolf Sentry is the embedded use case, the emphasis for and our integration and our development 
will always be on embedded and resource constrained endpoints and adding IDPS type capabilities in settings where it was, it was previously difficult or impossible, particularly um, endpoints that aren't, that don't have connectivity with the cloud, um, that are on standalone networks um, uh, and that are highly resource constrained. Awesome. Um, does Wolf Sentry require the other Wolf based products, for example, Wolf SSL, or can it work with other non Wolf applications and protocols like um, 1553B that are not TLS or SSH based? It does, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a standalone technology. We will be um, supplying turnkey commercial off the shelf plugins and integrations into all of our products. Um, but you don't need to use those plugins. If you have, if you want to use Wolf Sentry in your own technology environment um, with a completely different technology stack, you will be able to do that and you'll be able to do it easily. Fantastic. Um, Wolf, will, will Wolf Sentry replace my regular firewall? No, actually, I really should have called this out in, in, in the, the slide deck. Uh, Wolf Sentry is, is synergistic with existing firewall technologies. And in fact, it's synergistic with an, uh, existing IDSs and IDPSs. Wolf Sentry exists only embedded inside the endpoint. And traditional firewalls and, and IDPS solutions um, are part of the network and part of the infrastructure. And they can, you, you could actually set up rules inside your existing firewall system that would look for traffic from, that, that was actually generated out of a plugin um, that you've put into Wolf Sentry. So the, the, the integration opportunities are endless, but the, the short answer is you don't give up any of your existing um, sunk costs um, techno technology stack in order to add Wolf Sentry. Wolf Sentry is purely additive. Uh, fantastic. Is there a way to integrate custom sensors and actions beyond the traditional firewall slash snort type of model? Yeah, absolutely. So the, an action could literally be anything. So just think about what you can do with code in an application. The, the plugin that you install and, you, and then you hook in in your, your, um, your policy could perform anything. It could launch a bash script that orchestrates some platform level response if you wanted it to. It could install a firewall rule into a kernel firewall if you have Wolf Sentry only running inside your application. It could do anything, basically. Awesome. Um, what is the typical memory footprint of Wolf Sentry? And what is the average CPU workload? So for footprints, we're, we're aiming for like a minimal configuration, adding somewhere around 64K um, to the, the text size, the, the code, the, the, the object code, um, and somewhere around 32K to the volatile state. Um, that would not be enough to do the dynamic um, rule uh, use case with an effective response to a distributed denial of service attack, but it would be enough for a, a small, simple configuration. But we keep we're we're keeping an eye on on those those uh, figures of merit um, at every step of the way because the embedded use case is our top use case for it. Kajal, what was the second half of that question for the last part? Um, the second half, so what is the average CPU workload and do you have a minimum recommendation regarding a, the ARM Cortex, so version 7, version 8? The, the, um, the, the CPU load, the CPU load, it's so small that in most applications it would be unmeasurable. It would be on the order of hundreds of cycles. Less, less than a thousand CPU cycles in order to make a, a typical decision. Um, and it's heavily optimized for the multiprocessor um, and multi-thread uh, use case also. So you know, anytime you are performance sensitive, you'll get 
full benefit, Wolf Sentry will, will never be a bottleneck. Um, virtually all operations that you're already performing uh, in your network stack, in your application, and in your TLS library will be more computation intensive than Wolf Sentry, all by design. So in terms of minimum CPU resources, um, if you can do the other things, you'll be able to do Wolf Sentry is, is the basic answer to that question. Okay, and then do you have a recommendation regarding ARM Cortex, like a specific? V7, V8, I, I mean, like I said, if, if your resources are already adequate to run an MQTT library with, uh, with TLS um, and, and to process, you know, UDP and, uh, and especially to process TCP traffic, then you already have the resources to add Wolf Sentry. I mean, in, unless you, you're already built out right to the limits of your target. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> will Wolf Sentry run completely in application layer or does it need to be integrated in the operating system? Uh, yes to, well, no to both. You can run it inside the application as a library that's linked in and all the volatile state is just maintained in the application's memory space. Um, but we, we also have um, in, in our roadmap, um, a client server architecture that allows it to run within a master application and then have other applications use um, inter-process communications in order to communicate with it. That's particularly relevant to the embedded Linux use case. That's not so relevant to like a free RTOS type or a DOS type um, application. And we do also um, envision a kernel resident mode for it, um, but our initial use case is, is having it live entirely inside the application. Um, on your slide, you mentioned GL, uh, GPL v2. Will you offer a pure commercial license option? Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, GPL v3 is it, that it speaks to v3. Um, oh. That's just our for our initial release, our preview releases and such. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, we'll be offering a commercial licensing options. Uh, usually, for I think for all of Wolf SSL, Wolf SSL products, we're dual license, so we have both that's a commercial license uh, option as well as GPL v3. Um, does the Wolf Sentry API have some form of secure authentication to it uh, to stop it to stop a hacked app from reconfiguring Wolf Sentry and hence rendering it useless? <laughs> this is a bit, so this this speaks to the inter protecting yourself from internal bad actors um, use case and it's very very interesting. The 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 configuration in which you have a master application and then you have client applications that are consulting it, I will be building those sorts of protections into it. Um, uh, it's in the roadmap and that's an obvious thing to do. The same thing goes for when we uh, integrate it into the kernel, um, that the, the, the kernel will be imposing mandatory access controls. Um, and there's many ways to do this. Um, you can have pre-shared key type um, the, the X11 does it this way, where you have a shared secret. Um, and we'll be using that technique. Uh, but the main thing is that the master application will not be trusting the client applications implicitly. There will be um, access control options with that. And obviously, when, when you embed uh, Wolf Sentry inside the application, you are implicitly trusting that application. And that's why the, the client server um, IPC-based uh, multi-application um, embodiment of Wolf Sentry is so interesting because it allows you to have a master application with minimal complexity and maximum trustworthiness that's taking care of security for a large set of less higher complexity, less trusted applications without trusting those applications. Fantastic. Um, Wolf, will Wolf Sentry be backward compatible with older previous versions of Wolf SSL? Oh, that's an interesting question. 
it would be possible and probably not even very difficult to backport the call ins and call back mechanisms that we have added to the TLS library in order to integrate Wolf Sentry. Um, our advice is always to use the latest greatest, but we recognize that some, uh, some customers aren't in a position to do that. Um, it's integrated only into the TLS part of LiveWolf SSL, of, of the Wolf SSL library itself, which means that you can run in FIPS mode. It's fully compatible with, with running in FIPS mode because it, it doesn't actually touch the crypto layer itself. Um, is it dependent on Ethernet stack? Will it work on networks not based on an IP port or like um, MIL STD? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, mil military standard. Um, gotcha. Yeah, it, it'll run on in, in using any addressing scheme. It ha there's there's nothing in Wolf Sentry that's specific to IP, v4, v6, Mac, Ethernet, There's, there, it's all generic. So you can run on any network. Like I said, you could be using it in order to filter USB connections if that's what you wanted to do, which is actually not a bad idea. Um, and can you give an example, or I guess this person wants an example use case of running Wolf SSL or Wolf Sentry in an avionics device? Well, there's, I mean, it, they, they fall into two categories of example, the, the static and the dynamic um, scenario. Uh, and it boils down to how much do you trust your network? Um, if you have an avionics network where there's a potential for an attacker to be attempting to uh, in, uh, perform um, brute force credential guessing um, or uh, brute force um, uh, port scanning of um, any of the, the, the usual sorts of, um, of uh, attack patterns, um, then it becomes very easy to, to recognize the dynamic use case in an avionics environment where you want your endpoint to stop uh, processing any traffic from the, 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 uh, the abusive peer. And the, the, the way you would use the static use case in an avionics environment is that you would have green listed known good uh, peer addresses, protocols, and ports, and you would only let those in, and you would ignore all other traffic. And that's, the, that's what you see in this use case here, where you see session stop by network filter. Um, the problem with the static use case, and this is, this is always true, the problem with static um, is that once people learn what your static configuration is, then they can tailor their attack in order to meet the static expectations and your system can't dynamically respond to them. And that's why the dynamic use case is so interesting because it allows it to dynamically respond to the effect that the abusive traffic is having on your system rather than having to guess what your, your, your threat actor is going to look like from um, a network connection perspective. Awesome. And that was the last of our questions. Um, I would like to just thank everyone for coming to this fantastic webinar. Thank you, Daniel, for a really informative and interesting webinar on Wolf Sentry and IDPS. Um, as a reminder to everyone, this webinar is recorded and will be made available uh, on our YouTube channel in the following days, as well as if you would like a slide deck or slide set of the webinar, please feel free to email us at facts at wolfssl.com and we'd love to help you. And please feel free also to email us with any additional questions or comments you may have. Um, and we, we'd love to get your feedback and hear back from you. Uh, thank you so much and have a fantastic day. Thank you, Kajal. Bye everybody.